Good evening, everyone. I don't know um, how about you, but um, in the last few hours, the song, the hymn, Showers of Blessing, was going through my mind. I think this welcome rain has cooled things down a little bit, isn't it? And it's so nice to, to be here. But we have been blessed throughout the last fortnight, isn't it? And uh, we are grateful to Pastor Ski that he's here with us, and I welcome him here to the platform. He's been talking for so many days, and yet we are not satisfied yet, isn't it? <laughs> the problem with evangelists is they never talk about themselves. They talk about Jesus, about everything that is important, isn't it? And they kind of diminish themselves, trying not to talk about themselves. But you know, we are curious, <laughs> Pastor Skid. So uh, I think that we have some questions that we would like to ask you. You know, maybe they're a little bit personal, so if you are, if you, if it's something, you know, probably just a cut, cut, you know, we want to ask that one. But um, we would just like to know a little bit more about you. Mm -hmm. And maybe, the, you know, I, I have been quite curious because I took him a couple of times with me out and uh, I asked the questions. And maybe the first question that, that has been uh, maybe sent to ask is about, uh, the first obvious question is, Pastor Andy Skiti, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> a brief history about you. Yourself. Originally from uh, Barbados <laughs> in the West Indies. We have some Barbadians scattered around. Um, but most of my life, I've lived in the United States. Most of my life, originally a Catholic, and I was on my way to being a priest. I used to serve on the altar with a priest, an acolyte, as you'd call it. But according to my, one of my older sisters, my mother observed that the priest had an interest in me as a potential priest. So she took us out of the church and kept us at home. She did not want me being a priest. She had no idea I'd become a preacher. <laughs> uh, somehow, my mother heard about the Sabbath. I believe she heard it from Herbert W. Armstrong, for those of you young enough to remember that preacher, from the world tomorrow. And... Um, she went in search. She asked about the Seventh Day Advent, about a Sabbath keeping church, not knowing anything about Seventh Day Adventists. And we had a friend who was an Adventist, and uh, he took us to his church, and that was it. I, people always ask me, "What is your conversion story?" I really don't have a conversion story because I grew up in a very with a very spiritual mother, mm. and so I've all been accustomed to praying and praying and praying, and that's how I was raised. So there's nothing spectacular. At some point in my life, I decided to continue that way. But there's nothing, I wasn't a drug addict who came to Jesus or a guerrilla fighter who came to Jesus. I have just been, I just grew up in a Christian home, and that is it. Um, three sisters, two brothers. My father passed away in 201 in London, actually. My younger brother passed away in 210, so I have three older sisters, and I am the last. And uh, as a child, I've always wanted to preach as a child, always. It was never, what shall I do, what shall I do? I always knew whatever else I did, preaching would have to go right along with it. Well, thank you very much. One wife, no children. One wife, no children. Now, the next question, I don't have it here with me. Okay. It's, it's, I, I want to ask you that question. Okay. But I'm pretty sure that this is a question many of you would like to ask. I think we are very impressed by the way that you are able to memorize the Bible. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? So, uh, so I think that's, that's uh, wonderful to see a man of God actually not using uh, uh, the text itself. But so we would like to know how, how that passion came about. But also I think very important, do you have any tip to tell us how you actually go about and do it? When we uh, joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church, at that time in the church, there was something called the Morning Watch, which was part of MV, Missionary Volunteer Society, which is now called AY. And you had to learn a Bible text every day. It was just required. And during the MV service, everybody came back, young, old, everybody came back. And you recited your verses, and everyone was competing to recite, young and old. And so I grew up in that environment, and it stayed with me. There was also an elder in my church called Elder Payne. And he would preach without looking at the Bible. And I was a young boy watching him. And I said to myself, how does he do that? I would love to do that. That's what I said. Uh, he had no idea the effect he had on me. And uh, so that's how the Bible thing came. But as far as 
there's no special technique, just constant hard work. In uh, Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 601, Paragraph 4, Ellen White writes, that which at first seems difficult by constant repetition grows easy. Uh, we call that practice makes perfect. But I've seen that in the memorization of Bible passages. If you do something over and over, there's some verses or some passages people think I could never memorize the genealogy of Matthew or Luke. No, you can. If you stick with it and stick with it. And so I always recommend four things. One, you must have the desire. Many of us do not have the desire. We think it's nice, but not for me. We don't have the desire. Because when you desire something, no one can stop you from getting it. Two, you must have discipline. Discipline means if it rains, I do it. If there's an earthquake, I do it. If I'm dying, I do it. Nothing stops me from doing it every day of the week. That's discipline. The other is determination. I will not give up. Let's say you're trying to memorize John 11.35. Even if it takes you six months to memorize it, you stick, you stick, you stick until you get it, even though that verse only says Jesus wept. And, uh, <laughs> and the fourth one is divine help. You ask God to help you because that is his book. And also, as Seventh-day Adventist, we are known for the Sabbath. The first word in that commandment is remember. We are commanded to remember, which means the use of the memory. Way back in the Old Testament days, nothing was written down. Everything was passed on from person to person orally. So you had to remember. Uh, even up until the 1800s, there's some, uh, the Zulu nation, for instance, they, they passed on things orally. Many cultures in Africa and outside of Africa have oral traditions. They don't have written histories. And so when the Bible says remember, it calls upon us to use our memory. And so there's a biblical command to use your memory. And I recommend it because the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So try, try, try. And the Lord, I have friends all over the world who've begun to do it. And uh, they are amazed at what God has helped them to do. Thank you. Thank you. We're happy that it's not only no pain, no gain, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Although we started with elder pain, uh, how we go, but, mm -hmm. but we know there's much more to it as mm -hmm. well. Um, thank you. Now, there is another question here. It says, when you get to meet our Lord in heaven, mm -hmm. what one thing would you like to ask him or say to him? I don't deserve to be here. Mm-hmm. I just don't deserve to be here. That's what I tell him. Then I thank him. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a fair point, is it? Yeah. Third one, what is Randy Skeet's, what is Randy, Randy Skeet's legacy going to be, or what would you like it to be, especially here for us in Slav? That you develop a love for God's word, just the word of God. You recognize it as God's will for your life. And that you start every day, go through the day, and end the day with the word of God. Your Savior said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. If you look at the Bible carefully, God created by the word. He sustains creation by the word. He sanctifies by the word. He uh, exposes our motives by the word. He casts out demons by the word. He heals by the word. He raises the dead by the word. It is all by God does nothing outside of his word. And so I hope that when I'm gone or long, even before I leave, that some of you would have made a decision to become more personally acquainted with the word of God. Amen. Now the next question says, like Paul, we know he mentored Timothy and Titus and others. Do you have people you mentor, and what is the importance of mentorship for the continuity of the gospel? Well, the people that write me from all over the world, and young men who write, and I write them back, uh, mentorship is important because uh, it's like, yes, you said Paul and Silas, you pass on your experience to others because you won't live forever. And uh, so, yes, mentorship is important. Good. Another one. To our audience in the valley, valley of indecision, mm -hmm. whether to accept Christ or not, what would you like to say to those people who are still kind of not sure? You know? Make a decision now. The longer you wait, the less likely you are to make it. 
So make the decision. Don't wait until you understand everything. That is a trick of the devil. No one will understand everything from the Bible. But do you know enough to say, God wants me to follow him? God wants me. Do you know enough to make that decision? Make it. You know, when Jesus healed the ten lepers, most people whom Jesus healed, he healed them right in his presence. But for the ten lepers in Luke 17, 11 to 19, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. The Bible says, and it came to pass as they went, they were tense, as they were going. So they left him still as lepers, but in the act of obedience, they realized they had been cleansed. If you are convicted by the word of God, do not put it off. Make a decision and then watch God work things out for you. Because if God wants you to serve him, he will make it possible for you to serve him. And I'm speaking to young, old, and in between. Never put off a decision to obey God. Never. Thank you. And maybe the short one, if he chooses to invite you to come again, would you come? Oh, yes, by God's <laughs> grace, yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you very much. We were given only 10 minutes, and 10 minutes has passed. And, okay. Um, I think um, that we have been really privileged to, to, to see God working, you know, in our, in our midst, in our presence, and we are mm -hmm. grateful for that. Before we give a word to Pastor Skid, shall we bow our heads and pray? The Heavenly Father, our Lord, we want to thank you for everything. We thank you for this uh, respite from the hot weather. We thank you for the all the good things that we have received in our lives, but especially what we have received in the last 14 days. Lord, please, as we close tomorrow and we continue this evening, let this legacy stay with us. As Pastor has suggested, there are things that we would like to continue to go on in this church and in the community around us. But now, dear Lord, I pray for Pastor Ski that you be with him, that your Holy Spirit pours himself, himself out through him. And Lord, that we may all benefit and that we may all remember, but also practice what we hear in our lives. This we pray, dear Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. God is good. And all the time. Yes, Psalm 100 verse 5. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. You know, God is a God of truth. He really is. And when we doubt God's word, we call him a liar. And the Bible tells us that in 1 John 5, verses 9 and 10, when we do not believe, thus saith the Lord, we effectively call God a liar. And to call God a liar is to call him the devil, because Jesus said the devil is the liar. He is the father of lies. And so be quite sure that you're not calling God a liar by doubting his word. How can you doubt the word of someone who simply says, let there be light, and the light comes? That is a powerful, powerful word. You know, Ella White writes, the creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the word of God. This word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise, accepted by the will, received into the soul. It brings with us the life of the infinite one. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. A tremendous statement that the power that created heaven and earth is right here in God's word. But when the word is believed and obeyed, are you with me? All right, who's with us today? You're not a Seventh-day Adventist. You're visiting for the first time. May I see your hand? 
You are not the, ah, we have some good looking people who are visiting with us. Please stand, please stand. We want to know who you are. My dear sister, what is your name? Bertha. Hello, Bertha. How are you? Where are you from? Slough. Now, where are you from originally? Gone is a good place. I've been about six or seven times, always, almost always, to Kumasi. I hope to go there again. Bertha, who invited you? Your friend invited you. What's your friend's name? Yulili. That's a good name. Bertha, thank you so much for coming. I speak for the entire church. And may the Lord bless your life and make you a blessing to others. Say amen. amen. All right, Sister Bertha, right behind, ladies first. What's your name? Hmm? Collier, that's the first name, and you're from Slough, originally? Nevis, ah, my part of the world. Yes, how is Nevis doing? Oh, you get, <laughs> okay. St. Kitts and Nevis. All right, well, who invited you, Sister Collier? Who? Sister Straker, that's my sister. All right. Well, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. And may God place his hand of mercy and goodness upon you and never, ever remove it. Somebody say amen. 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 Our sister from Nevis. Yes, my good brother. What's your name? Vinay. Who? Vinay. Vinay. Spell that for us. Oh, Vinay. Sounds like he's from India. Okay. How are you, brother Vinay? It's good to see you. And you're from India originally? I have been there twice. I've been to Hosur, Bengaluru, which used to be Bangalore, uh, Mumbai, and uh, Pune, which used to be Pune. And I look forward to going to India again. Large country, very huge country. Who invited you, Vinay? Brother who? All right. Thank you very much. Vinay, we're glad you came. God bless you, and whatever your desires are, may the Lord grant them to you generously. Say amen. All right, my, you may be seated, please. Anybody else? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist, but you are worshiping with us. Just raise your hand. Are you? Oh, I see you smiling. Is there, is there someone else? Oh, this lovely lady who will not look up at me, but I will keep looking at her until she looks up. Now, somebody... <laughs> Look up, sister. It's okay. The Lord loves you. Would you please, please stand so all the world can see who's trying to hide in the presence of God. Please. Ah, there she is. What's your name? Esther. Oh, a good Bible name. Where are you from, Esther? Originally. Grenada. Ah, I had an aunt who lived in Grenada, but I've never been there myself. The Spice Island, the land of Eric Gary. All right. Now, who invited you, Esther? Sandra, and who else? All right. Well, we're glad you came. Now, do you live in Slough? Where do you live? Middlesex. How far away is that? Is that far from here? 25 minutes. Near Illinois. I don't know where that is either. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sister Esther, God bless you. God bless you. And may the angels of God protect you wherever you go. And the Spirit of God guide your choices and your decisions. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Say amen for all of them together. Amen. One more time. Amen. God is good. God is and all the time. God is yes, I love you and I want you to know that because you're God's people. Oh, thank you, sister. Let's live next to each other in heaven. Thank you very much for that. So we can keep telling each other how much we love each other in heaven. All right. I miss my little children, my little people. I do. Has anyone heard from them? How are they doing? Is it Essex or Sussex? Where are they? Sussex. Okay. Has anyone heard anything? Are they okay? Now they got there safely. Okay. How long was the drive? Oh, that's all? One hour? Okay, okay, so they arrive safely. How long will this event run? So they come back on Sunday. Okay, well, God bless them. I do miss them. I love to see them sitting in the front with their Bibles, taking half an hour to find the books of the Bible. <laughs> God bless them. All right. Uh, before I begin, I have just today and tomorrow to bother you. You know what this is? Now, what is that? 
what do I prefer you to use? A Bible. And God bless those of you who have brought Bibles in cooperation with your guest from across the Atlantic Ocean. Thank you very much. When you go to church, you should look as if you're going to church. Are you with me? If you study Exodus and the, 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 the way the sanctuary was built, it was built of materials that were blue, gold, uh, scarlet, purple, and white linen. Okay? The colors of the priest's garments were blue, gold, purple, scarlet, white linen. So when the priest was officiating, he looked like the church where he was officiating. Did that go over your heads? What am I saying is when you're going to church, look as if you're going to church. Look churchy. Are you with me? Is that a new word? Look churchy. And the churchiest way you can look is to have one of these in your hand. Yes, look as if you're going to church. All right, let me leave that alone. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And I, you know, I say that so often that people think it is not a serious request. It is a deadly serious request. Let me tell you something. Preaching is very, very delicate work. One wrong word, and you lose someone. That's how sensitive people are. One wrong, even if the word is truth, you say it the wrong way. And the devil is always trying to trip up the preacher. And so when I say, ask God to put his words in my mouth, God may have a softer word. I may have a harsher word. He may have a softer word to convey the same truth. Ask God to put his words in my mouth. That is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, which says what? Uh-huh. Behold. Ah, how nice. I give you a B plus for that. Uh, by tomorrow, you'll get an A plus because A is for Adventist. Okay, so you need an A. All right, and the third favor I ask is what? <laughs> Think, yes. What verse is that based on? Isaiah 118. Tell me the first part of that verse. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Yes, it's remarkable to think that the great God of heaven and earth stoops to reason with us. You see, our finite minds can't fully grasp God. And so God comes down to our level and he reasons with us. What a tremendous, tremendous sense of humility God has. And I love him for that. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful that you have preserved our lives today. We thank you, Lord, for the little showers that fell to cool the temperatures that have been so high. We thank you, today, God, that your love for us continues undiminished. As we bow in your presence, Father, if we've sinned against you in any way, large or small, we ask you, today, God, to cleanse us from sin. And the agent that does the cleansing is the detergent of the blood of Jesus Christ. Remove every stain, Father, that we may be fit to associate with holy angels. Grant to me your spirit. I humble myself before you, Father. I really do. I do not want your glory. You take it, day, God, because you deserve it. But grant to me your spirit. Grant to me the words. Grant to me the right attitude with which to speak this message. And bless all those sons and daughters of yours who've come. And the double blessing on our guest, Father. May they be so touched that they will be glad to come back. Bless all those watching via the internet, our internet family. Be very close to them, Father, and let them sense your presence, whether they are in a group or by themselves in their homes. Thank you, dear God, for the access we have to you through Christ. Thank you for the inspiration of your spirit. Thank you for the protection of your angels. Save us when you come, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's go to John, th well, no, let's go to John 3.16. Tell me what John 3.16 says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now let's uh, read that microscopically. We'll dissect the verse as we read. For God so loved the world. When you love, you give. That he gave the only begotten Son. Now there are two begotten sons in the Bible. Jesus Christ and Isaac. The Bible also calls Isaac Abraham's only begotten son, even though Abraham eventually had eight boys. Yes, he had eight sons. After he had Isaac and Sarah died, 
Genesis 25 verse 1 says, Then again Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimran and Jokshan and Medad and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. He had six more boys, which, which is a testimony to how good God is. Here was a man who laughed in Genesis 17 at the thought that he would have a child when he was almost 100 years old. He laughed. Romans 4.19 tells us his body was dead. But when God touched his dead loins, he filled it with so much life that he not only had Isaac, but the rep reproductive power remained with Abraham. He remarried and had six more boys. Amen. When God touches you, he touches you. God doesn't send a drop of blessing. He just douses you with blessings. And so Abraham had, but the only one of the eight who was a begotten son was Isaac, because Isaac was born when Abraham and Sarah themselves could not have children. So he was actually a product of God's uh, divine working. All right. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, what? Believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we have perish and we have everlasting life. Give me two different words. We have perish, everlasting life. Death and life, give me two different words, hell and heaven. The most popular verse in the Bible has both positive motivation and negative motivation. Some people say, well, you must go to heaven because you love Jesus. Yes, but one reason to go to heaven is to escape hell. Mm -hmm. Ellen White says, you have a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Now, the major reason is Jesus, but I, you know, every time I'm in the kitchen at home or wherever I am, and I come close to a hot stove, I say, Father, I do not want to go to hell. I've accidentally touched hot stoves in my life. I do not want to go to hell. And so the most popular verse has negative motivation. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, there's a key word in John 3.16, which is, whosoever believeth. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 verse 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. By grace are ye saved through faith. And this has led many Christians to believe all you've got to do is believe. And so there's a believe-only movement. Just believe, just believe, just believe. Even though the Bible is filled with texts that demonstrate that for God to work in our lives, there must be cooperation between us and God. For example, 1 John 1 verse 9, if we do what? Confess our sins, then he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we have a part to play. We must confess and God forgives. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so we have all through the Bible a condition. You have a part to play. God has his part to play. In other words, we are dirt. God is the life. And they come together. And when they come together, that's when we have a vibrant life. And so the Bible calls upon us to believe in Jesus Christ. Now, those who say believe only, they minimize obedience to God. You know, obedience is not popular among Christians. Well, among anybody. But since this is a Christian meeting, obedience is very unpopular among Christians because even though you are a converted person, you still have the fallen nature. Let's go to Galatians 5. Let's read verse 17. Galatians 5, verse 17. Our subject, the obedience of faith. Galatians 5, 17. Our subject, the obedience of faith, five minutes to eight. Do you have Galatians 5? Now listen to the struggle the Christian goes through, a converted person goes through. Read with me. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things ye would. Paul is saying, for the believer, there's a constant struggle. 
You see, when the Bible says that the old man is crucified, it does not mean your old nature is killed. It means it is no longer in control. Its reign, its control is what is crucified. But the old nature will always be with us until this mortal does what? Puts on immortality. That's when it shall be removed. All right. So we will always have this struggle to serve God or to yield to the enemy, serve God or yield to the enemy. The subject is the obedience of faith. And the question is, should we obey? Is there a role for obedience in the life of the child of God? And the Bible's answer is yes. Let's get right to the point. Let us go to uh, John 6. We'll read from verse 25. In this chapter, Jesus feeds 5,000 plus people with five loaves and two fishes. And I believe I've told you before, it is the only miracle of Christ that is found in all four Gospels. The feeding of the 5,000. Matthew chapter 14 is found there. Mark chapter 6. Uh, Luke chapter 9. And John chapter 6, you find the feeding of the 5,000. And they all give different items of information. So when you study all four, you can really build a picture of what really happened. Now, Jesus has fed the 5,000, and he takes a boat, goes over the lake. But people know a good thing when they see it, and so they follow him. In verse 25 of John 5, the Bible says, And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, whence camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Now, this is a very, this is a strong condemnation. Jesus said, you're following me for what you can get out of me. You know, many people join churches for that reason. The church will help me, help me with my rent. The church will help me buy food. The church will help me with my children. I can get a husband if I go to that church or a wife. The church will help me. The church will do these material things for me because they're nice people. And so people join the church for what the church can provide for them at the material level. And this was the attitude the 5,000 had towards Jesus Christ. And Christ offered what amounted to a rebuke. He seek me not because he saw the miracles, but because he did eat of the loaves and were filled. Next verse, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So Jesus says, don't focus on the material thing, focus on that which extends into the life to come. Now, let's read verse 28 together. What does that say? Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? They say, What is it God wants us to do? Very good question. And you must always ask that question. For God so loved the world. Many people run into trouble with the Bible because they take one text and they build a church on one text. One such text is uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse uh, 3 and 4. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them that believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. So people take that text and say, ah, I can eat pork. I can eat lizards. I can eat whatever, snakes. No, no, no. When you study the Bible comprehensively, you realize that verse is not saying that. You cannot take one verse and say, the Bible says. You may say, that verse seems to say, but to say what the Bible says, you've got to take from here, from there, a little over here, a little over there. You bring it together, and then you have some idea of what the Bible says. Now, obedience is the condition of salvation. Let's see that said elsewhere in the Bible. Go to Revelation 22, the last chapter of the Bible. Revelation 22, our subject, the obedience of faith. And we'll read verse 14. It's 5 after 8. Revelation 22, reading verse 14. When you found that, say amen. Read, read with me. What does it say? Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Question for you. How did we lose the right to the tree of life? The disobedience of Adam. How did we get it back? Obedience through, of course, the power of Jesus Christ. And so here's another verse that presents obedience as the foundation or the condition of salvation. Now, 
Let us go to uh, Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6. Now before I tell you what verse to read, I, will, I, I want you to read 2 Peter 3.13. Now don't use Deuteronomy 6. Don't lose it. Keep one finger on it. You have nine fingers left. Find 2 Peter 3.13. When you found Second Peter, let me know. We'll read that, but don't lose Deuteronomy 6. Do you have Second Peter 3.13? Yes. Read with me. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens, come on, and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, what are we looking for? A new heaven, a new earth. What do we find in both? Righteousness. What's the lifestyle in heaven? Righteousness. What should be the lifestyle among us? Righteousness. What will be the lifestyle in the new world? Righteousness. Now let's take a look at righteousness. Go to Deuteronomy 6. Let's see what we ought to do to prepare to live in a world where everything is righteous. Which is a difficult place for a sinner to live. He'd ask to be killed. Deuteronomy 6. Verse 25. Are you there? Let me pray. Father, as I continue with this message, please, God, remember, put your words in my mouth and your spirit in my heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Read that verse for me. What does it say? And it shall be our righteousness, come on, if we observe to do, come on, all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Now, what do you notice about that verse defines righteousness? What is righteousness? Obedience to God's commands. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Go to Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51. We'll read verse 7. The first part of Isaiah 51, 7. We'll read that. When you found that, say Amen. Read with me. Hearken unto me. Come on. Ye that know righteousness. Stop. God is saying, those of you who know righteousness, listen to me. But then God helps us to understand who it is that knows righteousness. Keep reading. The people in whose heart is my law. Yes. You cannot separate righteousness from the law of God. Go to Psalm 119. God bless that little angel. And give her peace. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you, says Jesus. The world has one kind of peace, God gives you another kind. Psalm 119, verse 142. You have that? Read with me, what does it say? Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy is the truth. All right, read verse 144 now. The righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Now, what are the testimonies? Go to Ezekiel 31, read verse 18. Not Ezekiel, sorry, Exodus 31, verse 18. We just read, the righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Exodus 31, verse 18, we want to identify what the testimonies are. Exodus 31, verse 18, read with me. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. What are the testimonies that are righteousness? The law of God. Go to Exodus 25. God has given Moses instructions for the building of the ark, that box that contained the Ten Commandments. And here's what God tells Moses, Exodus 25, verse 16, read with me, and thou shalt put into the ark, come on, the testimony which I shall give thee. Yes, the testimony being the ten. Read verse 21. Thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put what? The testimony that I shall give thee. The testimony refers to the Ten Commandments. Now, you listen to Psalm 119, verse 144 again. The righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Now, read verse 172 of Psalm 119. Verse 172 of Psalm 119.
Do you have that? Yes. Read with me. My shall speak of thy. First verse. For all thy commandments are righteousness. Go to Luke 18. Luke 18. We're looking at the foundation or the condition of salvation. And I have said it is obedience. And many Christians find that hard to swallow. No, I just believe and I'm saved. There's a condition for salvation. It is obedience. There's a condition to be lost. What is that? Disob mm -hmm. Both have conditions. What, where did I send you? Luke 18. Reading from verse 18. When you found that, say amen. Read with me. And a certain lawyer asked, a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to what? Inherit eternal life. Now, he didn't say, what shall I do to save myself? He said, what shall I do to inherit? And when you inherit, you get something from somebody else. Are you following me? What shall I do to inherit? How can I get eternal life from God? So he isn't saying, how can I save myself? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Listen to Jesus. Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? None is good save one. That is God. Keep reading. Thou knowest the commandments. Thou, what, what is Jesus saying? You want eternal life? What is he telling him? That's how you live. Mm -hmm, that's how you live. And in Luke chapter 10, when the lawyer asked Jesus, which is the first commandment, and Jesus told him, he, and Jesus said, what have you read? What is written in the law? He said, love your God and love your neighbor. Christ said, this do and thou shalt live. The condition of salvation is, but the obedience is by the power of Christ. Are you with me? Let me say it again. Well, let the Bible be more effective. Go to John 14. John 14, let's read from verse 9. And see how the power to obey works in us. Because we will see how it worked in Jesus. John 14, reading from verse 9. <coughs> when you found that, say amen. amen. Read with me. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Keep reading. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? Carefully now, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. Keep going. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Now, Jesus is saying, the Father dwelt in him. Don't ask me how. And worked through Jesus. Now listen to Paul. You know this verse without looking. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So the way it worked for Jesus is the way it works for us. The Father worked through Jesus, and Jesus works through us. And so obedience is the condition of salvation, but the power to obey is the presence of Christ in us. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians 5. Put on your thinking caps. 1 Corinthians 5. I'm going past 8.30, let me tell you, early. How many of you have to go to work right after the service? Okay. All right. Okay. 1 Corinthians 5. Let's read from verse 7. Give you a couple seconds to find it. Are you there now? All right. Read with me. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, he, as ye are unleavened. Finish the verse now. For even as Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us now. What does Paul refer to Christ as? Our Passover. And what was, hap what was done to the Passover? It was sacrificed. What was Paul referring to? Christ's sacrifice on the cross, yes. He calls it the Passover. Now, there was an Old Testament ceremony called the Passover, which pointed to that event. So the Passover symbolized Christ giving his life on Calvary's cross. Are you with me? Okay. And we know the cross is the very foundation of the plan of salvation. Now, let us go and take a look at the Passover. What's our subject? The obedience of faith. And what have I been saying all night? What have I been saying all night? The condition... Of salvation is obedience. All right. It's a concept most Christians don't like. But the Bible will fix that. Exodus 12. Let's read from verse 1. 
Exodus 12, reading from verse 1. This is where we are introduced to the Passover feast, which symbolized the death of Christ on Calvary's cross. You know, Paul said, I determined, determined to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. The central event, that cross event as the theologians call it. Now we're looking at it as it was symbolized in the Old Testament. Exodus 12, reading from verse 1, read with me. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, what he's saying is the month when they came out of Egypt, God said that month will be the first month of your religious year. Okay? So that was the month Abib or Nisan. Verse 3. Speak ye unto what? All the congregation of Israel saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Verse 4, And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Keep reading. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. What details do we have so far based on those four verses? What details do we have? <clears throat> Well, on the 10th day, what happens? Verse 3, on the 10th day, you choose the lamb. Okay, every household should choose a lamb. Mm -hmm. Any other details you see there? Say it again. Well, a lamb for a house, yes. All right, let's read on and get some more details. Go to verse 5. Your lamb shall be? Without blemish, a male of the first year, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Okay, so we have take it on the tenth day, but the tenth day of which month? The first month. Okay, so we have two details. Now we go to verse 5. It must be what? A male, that's the third detail, of the first year. It must be without blemish, and ye shall take it out from the sheep or the goats. So we have all these details so far. Verse 6, read with me. And you shall keep it up until the, what, 14th day of the same month. And so you choose it on the 10th day, you kill it on the 14th day. It must be a male, first year, without blemish, one for a house. Okay, now we go to verse, uh, finish verse 6. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall do what? Kill it in the evening. Now let's go, give me some details now. Now this ceremony represents what? Calvary's cross, yes. This represents the death of Christ on Calvary. We're getting all these details. Let's go down the list. Detail number one. Choose it on the tenth day. Detail two of what month? The first month. Give me another detail. One for a house, all right? Give me another detail. If the house is small, share it with the family next to you, all right? Another detail. Must what? Without blemish, come on. A male, first year, uh-huh, from the sheep or the goats, uh-huh, come on. Verse 6, you keep it up until the 14th day, uh-huh, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it when? In the morning. In the evening, yes, there's the details. Let's go to verse 7 now. Read with me. And they shall take of the blood and strike it where? On the two side posts and the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Give me some details from verse 7. Come on, it's right in front of you. Take the blood. Splash it where? On the two side posts, the upper door posts. All right. Let's go down to verse 8. Read for me. And they shall eat the flesh in that night. Roast. So when do, when do you eat it? At night, mm -hmm. keep reading, roast with fire and with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Now give me some details from eight. Eat the night, mm -hmm. roast with fire, unleavened bread, bitter herbs. Let's go to verse nine. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water. Keep reading, but roast with fire his head with his and with the pertinence thereof. Give me some details from verse 9. Don't eat it raw. Don't soak it in water. Uh-huh. Roast it. Uh-huh. The head, the legs, the pertinence. Okay. Let's go to verse 10. 
And he shall do, you shall do what? Let none of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, come on, he shall burn with fire. Give me details from verse 10. Eat everything that night. If you're stuffed and you can't finish that animal, burn what's left in the morning. Let's go to verse 11. What does that say? And thus shall he eat it. Come on, with your loins girded, uh huh, your shoes on your feet. Come on, your staff in your hand. It is the Lord's Passover. Come, he shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. What are the details in 11? Your loins girded. You're ready to move, you see? Come on, your shoes on your feet, uh huh, your staff in your hand. Come on, you eat quickly. <laughs> eat quickly. Don't sit. The Passover was to be eaten standing. Don't sit. Now, can you remember all those details? All of those pointed to what? Answer me now. Jesus' Jesus sacrifice. Calvary. Go to 12. Nice and careful. Read for me. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast. Come on. Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Carefully, verse 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token, come on, on the houses where ye are. Keep reading. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now, God says, when I come, I am looking for what? The blood. Does verse 13 say he's looking for anything else? Look at verse 13 and you tell me. What is he looking for? The blood. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. In other words, you'll be saved from the agent of destruction. When I see the blood, that's it. Or so it seems. Many Christians use this verse, oh, oh, no, I just believe in the blood. That's it. That's all God is looking for. No, that is not biblical. You must study the Bible here little, there little. Now, there's some details that were not mentioned in verses 1 to 13. Let's go further down the chapter and get some more details. Verse 22 of Exodus 12. Read with, well, let me pray again. Father, this is so critical. Please, Father, tell me, tell me what to say and how. Let your spirit work energetically to open minds and eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 22 of Exodus 12. Read with me. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin. Stop. Read verse 7. Go back to verse 7. Read verse 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Now verse 7 doesn't tell you, apply the blood with a bunch of hyssop. Are you following me? Verse 22 tells us that. That's why you must study verse, 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 verse. Ver so now we have more details. You've got to apply the blood not with a paintbrush, but with a bunch of hyssop. Not any bush you like. It must be, come on, tell me, hyssop. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is where? You must bring the blood in that container. All these are details. And then, and strike the lintel and the two side posts. Finish verse 22. And they shall, verse 22, and they shall, none of you go out the door of his house until the morning. So all night, where are you supposed to be? In your house. If you stepped out, what happened? Dead. None of you step out until the morning. Now, can you remember all those details? Try. Let's start with this side. Too slow, that side. Too slow, that side. You understand? <laughs> yeah, the tenth day, uh-huh. The first month, yes. Take a lamb, a male of the third or, or fourth year. First year. How many spots should it have? Any cut without blemish? Uh-huh. How many for a house? One. If the house is small, another house. Yes, indeed. Come on. Keep it until the 14th day and kill it in the morning. First thing. Uh, in the evening. That's right. Go to verse 7. Well, the whole congregation kills in the evening. Verse 7. Take of the blood. 
but add some information from verse 22 with a bunch of hyssop applied to the side post and the upper door post. Uh huh. What else? You eat it how? You roast it with unleavened bread. You eat it with bitter herbs. Don't eat it raw. Don't soak it in water. Should you eat all that night if you can? Yes. But if you can't, what do you do with the rest? Burn it with fire. You should eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your, your staff in your. You must eat it how? In haste. Mm -hmm. All of that. Now, listen to verse 20. Now, let's read verse 13. Then we'll go to verse 23. Listen to verse 13. Read with me. And when I see, and the blood shall be on to you for a token on the houses where ye are. Now the blood is a token. And when, come on, I see the blood, I will pass over you. Stop. Let's go to verse 23 now. What's our subject? The obedience of faith. Read verse 23 carefully. Read it for me. For the Lord shall pass through to smite the Egyptians. Come on. And when he seeth the blood, stop. Did we read that in verse 13, when I see the blood? Yes, same thing, but keep reading. When he seeth the blood, ah, where? On the two side posts and the upper door post. Because that's where he said to put it. Not just when I see the blood. You may get that impression from verse 13. But when you add 23, you realize, I want to see the blood where I said to put it. Yes. What is that? Obedience. Yes. Now, if God came by and the blood was only on the doorknob, <laughs> what would the destroying angel do? He would pass through that house. Are you not listening to me? I'm talking to myself. God said, I want to see that blood where I said to put it. On the two side posts and the upper door posts. If the blood is not there, my destroying angel is coming into that house. So it's not just the blood. Now, if God was so specific about where the blood should be, what can you deduce from that? What did God want to see? Uh, in how many areas of details? All of them. Mm -hmm. You see, God was looking. He had to see that the animal was chosen on the 10th day. So when the Bible says, when I see the blood, what it really means is, when I see that you did what I said and chose the animal on the 10th day, when I see that you chose a male of the first year in obedience to me, when I see that you chose one without blemish, when I see there was one for household or your share if the household was small, when I see you kept it up until the sixth day and you killed it in the evening on that day, when I see that you put the blood on the upper door post and the two side posts, when I see that you edit with, uh, you roasted it with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, when I see that you did not eat it raw nor soak it in water, when I see that you uh, had your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand. When I see that you added in haste. When I see that whatever was left, you burned in the morning. When I see all of that, the angel will pass over your house. Now you give me one word for all of that. Obedience. Obedience. And what does, Cal what does Passover represent? Calvary sacrifice. God says, when I see you have done what I said, I'll pass over you. Listen to me. Obedience, finish my words, is the condition, come on, of salvation. Do what I say, says God. And the power to do it, I'll give it to you. Because you cannot obey a divine command with human power. And so when I say obey, I always mean by the power of Christ. My brothers and my sisters, there's no such thing as only believe and just go to sleep and expect to wake up in heaven. You'll be the most surprised dead man you ever saw. <laughs> Obedience is the condition of salvation. Go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2. It's uh, 29 after 8. Give me 10 minutes. Genesis 2. Let's read verse 16, 17. Well-known passage. I know you know it. 
Genesis 2, 16, 17. Read with me. What does it say? And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. What did God breathe into Adam? The breath of life. Now God is saying, you can lose that if you disobey me. Now, Adam did not ask God to make him. Are you with me? He opened his eyes and there he was. But God requires service by choice. And so God took a perfect man <clears throat> in a perfect environment and virtually said to him, if you want this life to continue this way, no sin, no disease, no war, no fighting, no tribal conflicts, no Ebola virus, no Zika virus, no hoof and mouth disease, no racial prejudice. If you want this kind of life to continue, do what I say, don't eat this tree, eat from the rest. If you obey me, this life will continue. If you disobey, death will be introduced. Then what was the condition of preserving that life? Obedience. On what condition would he lose it? Disobedience. We are born with a nature that does not like to obey. And you need to come to grips with that. Listen to God's word. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Listen to what the flesh produces. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. And those are the products of the flesh, the way we're born. But the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. We have two products from two natures. The flesh, everything it produces is condemned by the law of God. The Spirit, everything it produces is consistent with the law of God. That's what the Bible says, against such there is no law. My brothers and sisters, we are born with a preference for disobedience. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be what? Born again. Start again and come back into this world as a spiritual being with a renewed mind. A mind now that loves the law of God. A mind that loves to do whatever God says. A converted person's greatest joy is to please God, even if it means loss of life. Have you ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs? No. Have you ever read about the martyrs who were killed? All right. Do you know some of them went to the flames singing hymns? They loved God so much. They willingly died. The three Hebrew boys. What happened to the men who tied them up and brought them to the furnace? They dropped dead before they got. So what did the three Hebrew boys do? How did they get into the furnace? They walked in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you want me in the furnace? Okay. They walked in. A love for God, exceeding love for life. An obedient mind is that kind of mind. I will obey God regardless of consequence. Too many of us will obey if it's convenient. We must obey if God says so, not if it's convenient. Because obedience is not convenient for the carnal nature. Nothing of God is convenient for the carnal nature. But you and I are now in the spiritual nature, and our greatest joy must be to do the will of God. And so when God collided with Saul on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, his natural question was, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Let me make a recommendation to you at 25 to 9. I said obedience is the foundation or the condition of salvation. Disobedience is the cause of all our problems. Or to use a shorter version of disobedience, sin is the cause of all our problems. Whether it's my sin or somebody else's sin, sin is the cause of all our problems. The longer I live, the more I counsel 
the more I realize 99% of our problems we bring on ourselves because we will not do what God tells us to do. We do, we're nice people. We come to church. We sing loudly. And we turn to type sometimes. But there are areas where we will not obey God. Tonight, I want you to make a choice to obey God. Please, obedience is life. It benefits your children. Let the Bible tell you that. Go to Deuteronomy 8 quickly. For those of you with children, if you don't want to obey for yourself, at least do it for the sake of your children. Deuteronomy 8, let's read from verse 1. Do you have Deuteronomy 8? Read from verse 1. What does that say? All the commandments that I commanded this day shall ye observe to do that ye may live and... What does multiply mean? Reproduce. Uh-huh. Go on and go in and possess the land which the Lord thy God unto your father. Obedience has blessings not only for the obedient person, but for those in that person's circle. Once again, in the presence of a holy God... And in the name of Jesus, I ask you tonight, make a choice to obey God. Here's what Jesus says about himself and the devil. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy, the thief being the devil. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus brings life, the devil brings death. But the devil brings death dressed up in attractive garments. That's how we dressed up death to Eve. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He dressed up death beautifully, and Eve accepted it. Jesus comes with life. But until he comes to do away with sin, there will be trials, yes. There will be tribulations, yes. As he perfects the character in readiness for a place in his kingdom. Because conversion is one thing, but now growing in grace is something else. They're both connected, of course. And part of that growth means you have to be tried and tested by God. You don't polish. If you're a carpenter or a mason, not a mason, uh, a joiner, as we used to call them in Barbados many years ago, you have to use sandpaper. Are you following me? It's rough. You've got to use sandpaper to get that thing smoothed down. And God puts us through a sandpapering experience but to save us. And so tonight I recommit my life to God. And I ask him to give me that mind, that new spirit, that will be willing to do whatever he says, and to do it with joy, and to live my life with the consciousness that the Bible tells me, obedience is the condition of salvation. How many of you will say, Father, give me a mind to obey you. Can I see your right hand? Stand up with me. A mind to obey you. Stand up with me. Someone else needs to make a decision to be baptized. Question for you. Does Jesus want you baptized, yes or no? Yes. yes. If you already are, fine. If you're not, he wants you baptized. There's a hand. We would... We, Okay, Jesus wants you baptized. God the Father wants you baptized. The Holy Ghost wants you baptized. Why? Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Is there someone who still needs to make a decision to be baptized or rebaptized because of the life you may have lived? May I see your hand? You still need... Ah, God bless you. My lovely God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. Can I get a piece of paper, please? Two daughters of God. Someone else, raise your hand. You really need to make a decision to be baptized. Just raise your hand. Obey God. It really is the safest life to live. And God will give you the power to obey him. The call was, Father, give me the mind to obey you. That's why you stood. My call is now, is this someone who still needs to make a decision to be baptized? The question is, who? 
Just raise your hand. I'll give you 60 seconds. Is that a hand? Okay, 60 seconds. 50 seconds now. A decision to be baptized in obedience to God and his will for your life. 40 seconds. Father, here's my decision to be baptized. I'm convicted as what you want for me, and I want to obey you from my heart. 30 seconds. A decision to be baptized or rebaptized. As you look at your life, there has been no growth for decades. You've been the same person. You need to start all over again and walk with your God. 20 seconds. A decision for baptism or rebaptism. Just raise your hand. 10 seconds. Then I'll pray. A decision for baptism, rebaptism. We stood to say, Lord, give me a mind to obey you. No disobedient person will be admitted into God's kingdom. Not one. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, dear God, I come to you to present to you those for whom your son shed his blood. As your sons and your daughters bow in your presence, Father, look upon us with mercy, with compassion, and with fatherly tenderness. Father, I believe there's still perhaps one, maybe there are two, still struggling with the decision whether to be baptized or rebaptized. And Father, I know you understand we're dirt, we're weak, we're uncertain. Your word says in Psalm 103 verse 14, for he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we're dust and dust is uncertain. Dust weakens, dust is nervous, dust panics. And you understand all of that, Father. But having said that, dear God, I ask you to rise above the panic of human nature and give Give to those persons the assurance that you will lead them by the hand. And so, Father, I pause one more time and I ask again, is this someone who still needs to make a decision to be baptized or rebaptized? Raise your hand now. I'll give you 30 seconds. Then I finish the prayer. Raise your hand now. You need to make a decision to be baptized or rebaptized. Raise your hand. 25 seconds. Then I will pray and close the appeal. The call is for baptism, rebaptism. if you are so convicted, not just because I call, I am not God. If the Spirit has been convicting you, maybe before these meetings began, you were under conviction by the Spirit. 15 seconds. Then make that decision now. A decision is a powerful thing. Once you make it, you feel strong regarding that decision. 10 seconds. A decision for baptism or rebaptism. And then I'll close the prayer. Father in heaven, thanks for the work of your spirit. Some people decide at different times. Father, you deal with us individually. I ask you in the name of Jesus Christ, as the service ends, do not close the door of mercy, dear God. Let your spirit continue to rustle. Yes, we know that you told the antediluvians in Genesis 6-3, my spirit shall not always strive with man. But Father, we want to believe that you're still striving with us who may be resisting. So Father, give us the assurance of that extended mercy, dear God, but let us not abuse it because there will come an end, a limit to that mercy. Let the words we heard tonight remain on our hearts, dear God. Let us leave Leave this place realizing the condition of salvation is obedience. Oh, Father, change our minds. Give us a love for doing whatever you say because you've made it so clear. If you love me, obey me. And that's the only way we show love. So, Father, bless every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. Bring us back tomorrow, dear Father, for a high day of service and worship tomorrow. Remember our little ones in Sussex at that camp meeting. Bless them, protect them to God and bring them back safely on Sunday. <clears throat> In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say amen and amen. Our closing hymn is our theme song. Let's remain standing.
Heavenly Father, as we enter into your Sabbath day as well, as the peace descends upon us, we have been comforted, but we've also given instructions how to come into a closer relationship with you. So Lord, let all these words that we heard tonight stick in our mind, that we may change our lives. And as we change our lives, we also change the lives of the people that we touch and live with. Lord, help us because we know that tomorrow is another day, and new challenges and new temptations. We want to remain as close as we are right now. But we cannot do it on our own. We need your Holy Spirit for that. So Lord, be with us. And as you dismiss us safely back to our homes, keep us safe on the road. And help us that we may rejoin tomorrow again to be with you, with God's people. Amen. Please be seated.